supposed to be on there it is hello welcome to the final panel uh, my name is Sarah Cofield um, I have been in the world of wildfire for 13 years now actually come up on my 13th anniversary in October doing stuff with smoke and air quality and in that process have spent a lot of time learning a lot about fire um, and that meant it was really really neat to see things really brought together so nicely um, in this book in a way that is I feel really approachable for the lay audience to kind of grapple with some of these complex topics and what we might need to see more of and understand about fire in order to live with it. Um, and so with that, uh, I just would like if uh, we have right with us one of the authors here, uh, Justin Engel, as well as the amazing illustrator, uh, Jesse, who I apologize, I don't know your last name, um, but it is up there, Jesse Stevenson. Um, and if you guys can maybe introduce yourselves and uh, how you got into this project. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. So I will do an, inter uh, an introduction by proxy for Nick Mott. Nick is um, co-author on this project and since his regrets, he had some last minute vehicle trouble. He lives over in uh, Livingston, Montana and was unable to make the trip and we just sort of were looking around at the screen and the lighting and thinking that a Zoom configuration um, wouldn't really work. Um, but the story of uh, my relationship with Nick is a big part of the story of the book, so I want to I want to make sure we we honor Nick and um, his amazing contributions to this, and telling a little bit of that biography as well. So, um, yeah, I'm a professor at the University of Montana in the business school. So you might be thinking, what on earth is a guy like that writing a book about wildfire? Um, and I'm still not sure I I have a tight story to address that, but. Um, I moved to town in 2012, and that fall was a particularly um, intense smoke year. Uh, I had young children at the time, and my wife at the time decided, well, both of us decided it was probably best to get them out of town. The smoke was intense. We were, you know, the kids were coughing. We were just confused and, and uncertain. We had not lived in a wildfire-prone landscape before and had not been around wildfire before. Oh, gosh. Those are the two girls that were little at the time that we got out of town. Um, yeah. So fearful for their health, we got them out of town for about three weeks. And I was also meeting new colleagues here at the university, some of which were being evacuated from their homes. And it just was kind of an intense uh, uh, kind of introduction to wildfire. At the time, I was running competitively and for whatever reason, thought that training outside would be a good idea, and Sarah's shaking her head, but, um, you know, if any of you are runners, you sort of make that calculation of, like, is this going to hurt me more than not running will hurt me? Um, so anyway, just trying to swim around and, and get my head around this new space I was living in. At the time, meeting so many amazing people in this community doing important, profound work in wildfire, whether they're fighting fires, doing fire science, uh, doing research at the, the, the College of Forestry and Conservation, um, all sorts of things. And so I just set out on a long kind of journey to understand it to the best of my ability. And that journey led to the, um, hmm, there we go. I, I got to hit forward instead of uh, reverse. So. That led to this project, Fireline. I don't know if any of you have seen this project, but it was a, a podcast, uh, um, sort of a journalistic endeavor. I had been doing a, an interview show for several years, um, but the interview show seemed wholly inadequate to telling a story about wildfire. And so this podcast started the journey. The illustrations you see here are done by Jesse. This was our kind of entry point to working together. And the podcast was well received. It was listened to by one of the editors at Bloomsbury, our eventual publisher, and his name is Anton Mueller. He reached out to us and said, have you two ever considered writing a book? And neither of us really had thought of it. Nick at the time um, is still is a fantastic environmental journalist, and I was thinking more and more about how to co communicate important topics of, of public interest to more people rather than writing journal articles in academic journals that very few people read. I wanted to try to reach more more people. And so, yeah, we just set off on this um, 
collaboration to bring this book to life. And having worked with Jesse on the illustrations um, for the podcast, uh, bringing her artwork and sensibility into this project seemed like what we had to do. So Jesse signed on to be our illustrator. And do you want to comment a little bit about your involvement? Sure. Great. This is on. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Jesse Stevenson. It's really nice to see so many familiar faces in the audience. Um, so thanks for coming and being here. Um, gosh, yeah. I, I can trace my experience with wildfire back to when I was a kid. I grew up in the foothills of the Mission Mountains up in Condon, Montana. And for folks who are from around here and know the Swan Valley, um, you know that that's part of this larger, very fire-dependent, fire-prone landscape. And so I grew up, luckily, with parents who taught me that you know fire is a part of the landscape, and it's something that needs to be here. It's something that shapes the landscape. Um, and Blackfeet on my mom's side. And so I also grew up in a storytelling culture and learning about how our ancestors used fire out on the landscapes and have used fire for generations and generations to improve grazing for the buffalo and to improve, uh, improve habitat for plant medicines and food. Um, and so from the time I was a kid, I learned that you know fire is this, this really wonderful thing out on the landscape. And then in 2003, we were living in Condon, and the Crazy Horse Fire started um, in the foothills of the missions. And it grew and grew and kept growing, and we kept watching this smoke plume from our house. And um, as it grew, you know, our parents taught us how to use wet towels to put out the embers that were falling with the ash. And when it got to 8,000 acres, my sister and I were under 18, and we were it was a mandatory evacuation for us, so we had to leave and go stay with friends across the valley. And all of a sudden, this thing that I had you know, learned about as this really wonderful and necessary part of the landscape also took on the role of being this like really scary thing that made us leave our house for a little while. And we got really lucky, thanks to the fire crews and all of their hard work and, and inversion, we were able to go back home after a few days. Um, and then later, we went to the fire scar and we collected morel mushrooms there and we kind of watched it fill in with all these species, both plants and animals that, um, that make their homes in landscapes that have experienced fire. Um, but it also, it meant that we looked at fire in a different way. And every summer after that, um, in the last, for the last 20 years, it's hard to believe that was 20 years ago, uh, we've wondered, you know, where, would, where will the next wildfire be and how close will it get and will it, Will it burn through our property at some point? And so I think like a lot of Montanans and like a lot of folks who live in fire-dependent and fire-prone landscapes, I grew up with kind of these thinking about wildfire from these different perspectives of it being this really wonderful medicine for the landscape and also it meaning that you know I might not be able to go out and run or that um, I might have to think about you know what it what it means to lose a house, potentially, or to lose a home um, to wildfire. And I didn't, surprisingly, go on to become a wildland firefighter or a smoke jumper like a lot of my family members. Um, but fire remained a really consistent part of my life. And uh, as I started work, I work in conservation now full time. Um, and when I started working in conservation, fire showed up as this really prominent sort of central theme. And, almost every conversation about people and place. Like somehow it would come back to wildfire and these other parts of the landscape that really shape the place and also the community and, and our response. And um, so when uh, a friend of mine, Victor Aveyas, who was one of the producers on the Fireline podcast, reached out to ask if I wanted to create cover art and then that evolved kind of organically into uh, cover pieces for each of the individual episodes. I was like, hell yeah, that sounds like a really fun way to continue exploring this thing that I feel like I know well, but also feel is like this, it's like this massive and growing being that I want to get to know better. Um, and then when, when Bloomsbury reached out and, and asked if uh, Nick and Justin wanted to write a book based off of the podcast, I was really honored to be asked to do the illustrations. And it was, we might talk a little bit more about process later, but the whole process, um, was 
just it was fun. It was it was I it was full of a lot of growth. I learned a lot. Um, it was great. So happy to be here. Thanks, everybody. Um, well, uh, we're trying to work out how this is going to go, but um, I guess maybe for folks who maybe haven't had an opportunity to get a copy of the book or read it, do you want to give us kind of a brief summation, as, as brief as you can? This is a darn comprehensive book of the history of fire and, and where we are now, um, uh, of like what the messages are in the book you want to make sure people would walk away with um, after after reading it. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. So. Um, the primary objective of the book is to help all of us understand the moment we're in with wildfire. And that's part of, there's a lot of stories that contribute to that. Um, but it's situated within a lot of the work being done on climate and climate change. And so much of what we see here and experience with climate change is, is really depressing and scary and um, oftentimes, it's really hard to do much with. You think, is there really anything we can actually do to fix this? And do we have any hope? And so wildfire is one of those topics within climate that I and Nick, and I think Jesse, and hopefully Sarah too, like we actually think there's tangible things that we can do both as individuals, but then achievable things that we can do as a society to kind of break the stalemate. So we, we approached the book in that spirit, that we wanted to um, have a spirit of hope, that we wanted to give readers tangible things that we can all do, um, both in and around our own homes, but at the community level, and then as citizens uh, who can advocate for better policies and partic participate in not only policy making, but also decision making at the local and national level. This book is organized into four sections. The first is a brief history of how we got here. And that history involves, um, I'm going to try, we have some of Jesse's illustrations here um, that I'll try to weave into the conversation. But I, I have these up here less um, to sort of tell the story and to guide the presentation, but more so you get a sensibility, a sense for the artwork. You know, here's a, a, a chart of acres burned over time. And what you'll see is, you, know, you see the increase, but one of the things you don't see on this chart is that, you know, prior to 1910, when we started a campaign of suppressing as much fire as we could, the number of acres burned in the, you know, what is now the United States uh, every year exceeded 10 million acres a year quite often. The other thing to consider is that acres burned is not necessarily a the right measure of fire severity. It's a measure, but it doesn't necessarily tell us. I mean, the the, the fire that um, destroyed Paradise, California, the campfire was 150,000 acres. That's a big swath of land, but relative to how you know it's a small relative to other fires, but it destroyed so much. So anyway, we, we talk about where we're at, you know, how we got to this current moment. Um, a lot of that can be traced back to the big burn in 1910. So this illustration kind of shows us where that fire was. There's a, a constellation of small fires came together under the right conditions to burn 3 million acres over a couple of days in August of 1910. Timothy Egan has written a great book about this. There's um, a bunch of other reporting, but this was a formative moment for the Forest Service where it set in motion a culture of suppressing all fires and the 10 a.m. rule, which was you know, any fire that's detected needs to be snuffed out by 10 a.m. the next morning. And we built a military-style apparatus around suppressing fire. And even as we were building that apparatus and executing it, we were starting to understand that snuffing out fire is not what the landscape needs that actually fire needs to play its role in the landscape. And as that science was emerging, it, it became clear that it's, it's hard to, it's actually hard to do that. We built a society and a system in which it's really difficult to allow fires to burn, to allow fire to play its natural role. Plus, we've also built a ton of our homes 
in what's called the wildland urban interface. So one in three homes in the United States lives in an area prone to wildfire. That's millions and millions of people, millions of values at risk, lives at risk. This is hard to let fires burn when it's near that stuff, right? You layer on climate change. And the simple mechanism of climate change is when you have warmer temperatures, you have more fire, right? There's a, some com complex components to that relationship, but the intuition's pretty simple. So we're actually living in what we could term a fire deficit. Based on the temperatures we're experiencing, we should be experiencing more fire than we have now in the system. And, you know, so that sort of paints a picture of a, of a daunting future, right? Like, hey, what we're doing is not working so great. We got really good at suppressing fire so good that all of us sort of expect when a fire comes out that the firefighters will, you know, put it out. And that's not as possible as it once was. And it's a harder, harder job for the people doing it. Not only is it harder in terms of the intensity of these fires, but it's harder in the sense that what was once a summer job is now a year-round job. And the stresses of these fires are accumulating, and the toll it's taking on the firefighting core is, is, is accumulating as well. So that's a resource that's sort of at its limit. So the early part of the book paints this picture of, of stalemate, but also like what we're doing is not working anymore. We've got to change our ways. And then the back half of the book talks about um, how we can change our ways at an individual level, and we can get into some of those tactics as we go, but also how we can change our ways at the community level and um, more broadly at, at sort of the, the national policy level, how we manage these landscapes and how we move within them, where we build, how we build um, some of the more daunting problems of collective action and policy and so forth. But um, that's basically the gist of the book. It's, it's part history, part science, part user manual. We want it to be a thing that, you know, you can sort of use as a reference guide. There's some checklists and other things in there. So information heavy, but we try to make it a, as digestible as we can. And um, I want it to be something that leaves you with a sense of agency, that this is one of those hard problems that we can actually um, Maybe not fix entirely, but but do a lot to make make things better. And I think we sort of, as folks that um, live in a place that's susceptible to wildfire, where wildfire is inevitable, we all kind of all have a responsibility to play that role too. That was that was fabulous. And one of the things you hit on that I think is really um, treated really well, I feel, in the book is the trauma that comes with being someone who works in fire, but also the folks who are faced with fire, either one that is threatening you with smoke or the ones that come and you're evacuated for or may lose, lose your home to. And, um, you know, we, we talk a lot about, uh, you know, you've, you talked about the art that is in this book. And I was hoping, Jess, you could talk about how art can play an important role in understanding and processing these complex topics as well as... Um, I don't want to like hit trauma over and over again, but but the emotions and and the the what goes into how we respond to what's happening around us. Yeah, thanks. Um, that's such a good question, and I think it. I think a a great place to start is just sort of asking like, why include art in a book like this? If you know, part history, part science, part sort of guide and user manual. Like, does art really need to be in there? And the way that I view art and illustration in a project like this is from a place of storytelling. Um, and again, I was raised in a storytelling culture. And throughout my childhood and kind of early years, started to think of storytelling as, you know, doesn't necessarily mean sitting around a campfire. Sometimes it is sitting around a campfire <laughs> and telling stories around fires, which we've been doing as humans for, you know, thousands of years. Um, but it can also look like art, and it can also look like you know, finding finding these methods of sharing information um, through words and and more than words to help convey some of these really hard and complex issues. Um, and so, my hope in creating illustrations for this book and also for the Fire Lion podcast um, was for the illustrations to really be additive and to sort of add maybe a little bit more of 
um, an emotional level to help to help make the book more personable um, and to recognize that like everybody out there interprets material and learns in different ways and if art can help you know even one person out there understand this really complex issue just a little bit better then hopefully that's you know that's a success um, especially as you know Justin mentioned just the accessibility um, of writing a book as opposed to writing like a journal article that only a few people are going to see if they're reading a very specific scientific journal and I think a lot about that with complex issues like wildfire and, and any science out there like how can we get more creative as human beings uh, to make these sometimes you know fairly elite fields that aren't necessarily accessible to all people how can we make those more accessible and I think that art in storytelling is one way to help do that. Um, and I also think that it it can help convey some of the, the pieces of issues like wildfire that are just really hard to put into words because they are so complex. Um, this piece might be a good example of that. This was um, a piece that was included at the very end of the book. I think it's the, the last illustration um, in a section that's really talking about renewal and how we move forward. Um, and the intention behind this piece was to sort of show that multi-dimensional relationship between fire and regrowth and also our work and efforts as human beings to fight fires when we need to, need to but more importantly to figure out how we live, like how we coexist with fire in a sustainable way. Thank you. Um, along those same lines, can you guys discuss the, uh, the process went into choosing uh, what we did il illustrate that the process of, of choosing subjects and also getting that through um, the publication process. Yeah, so this was, there's some backstory to this process that was uh, illustrative, if you will. Um, so the publisher, we got the sense that, I mean, we still had to write a proposal, right, and, and sell the proposal. And when we first wrote the proposal, Nick and I were met with some resistance from Bloomsbury. Uh, our editor was like, we just need this to be more fact heavy, more fact heavy. We got to tell people what they need to know. And, 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 and we got the sense that they kind of wanted a textbook. And we absolutely did not want to write a textbook. Um, that just wasn't the kind of book that we wanted to write. We wanted to write a book that people would actually read and to be and, and to sort of get into and we to do that we also and, and i mentioned before this kind of the doom and gloom nature of climate and nick has done so much reporting in, in, in climate change topics and yeah a lot of that reporting is doom and gloom so we didn't want to we want to give people a sense of hope when they read this book and you know our strategy of trying to do that was to make it conversational but also kind of you know, whimsy might be too strong a word, but but playful where it can be playful, and loose language where it can be loose, and 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 um, illustrations, and in particular Jesse's uh, sensibility, really seemed to pair well with that. Um, so we went through this process of trying to like we could we could uh, you know write and do things like this, but even a chart like this, I mean this beautiful way of like you know, making these appear like charred snags and you know, at one point this chart actually had um, another it, it had another axis that was meant to convey um, number of fire starts and that was depicted by sort of a, a mountain landscape right that that's the way the chart came to life anyway we decided to simplify the illustration but you got a sense for like the, 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 the sensibility we tried to bring to the illustrations and to the writing. Um, you know, and also, too, I think that a part of this work is to help people understand just that fire fire's not good or bad. It just is. It's a part of the planet. It's been around longer than we have. It's what sh has shaped this landscape. It's what shaped many cultures. And there's a beauty to it as well. I mean, there's a reason why we all will stare at a campfire and be mesmerized by it. Um, and we talked to 
anthropologists about why that is, and that plays a role in the story as well. Like, we wanted the sort of beauty and wonder of fire to come through in 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 this book as well, and I think in, in particular in Jesse's artwork. So I don't know if you have a, a sense for th how that tension between trying to convey information in sort of a you know infographic sense to convey information in an artistic storytelling sense. How did that play out in your approach? Yeah, um, I think I would go back to the word access and thinking about, we, we thought a lot about, and I know you and Nick and like the whole team thought so much about the audience. Like, who is this book being written for? You know, is it being written for just folks who live in fire prone landscapes and already kind of know about wildfire and sort of have a background and just, you know, want a deeper dive? Or is it being written for a much wider audience? And, and the hope is that it's being written for a much wider audience and that somebody in Montana who lives in the wildland urban interface and thinks about these things a lot could pick up the book and find something just as useful as somebody in New York City who's all of a sudden experiencing wildfire smoke for the first time. And to me, that, that thought process played a lot into the art and how we decided which illustrations to include and what the illustrations should be. And, and part of that was thinking like, well, if we want this to be accessible, what are things that we could better show through an illustration than, you know, describing like a Pulaski, you know, like how do you describe a Pulaski in words, a, this tool that's used in firefighting? Um, and if, if somebody doesn't, you know, already kind of know what that looks like. Um, and it's, Honestly, it's just more fun to show sometimes what that looks like. Um, and I also thought a lot about, yeah, I've talked about this a little bit already, but just that idea of creativity and including creativity in a book like this, I hope will also help to convey this idea that we as people need to be more creative in our approach to living with wildfire. Um, and if, if it was a textbook, you know, that, <laughs> that doesn't inspire a lot of creativity. It inspires learning, maybe, but maybe not that element of creativity that I think we all really, really need to embrace to a greater degree when we're figuring out this problem. And there was some pragmatic reality in that, too. We, we sort of were deciding how many illustrations and what should we illustrate. And our agent sort of stepped in and was like, look, your publisher has no idea. Like, you just need to tell them what you want and be a better, stronger advocate for yourselves. and." Just say, there will be 25 illustrations, and they will be of these things. Give them a list. Tell them it's, you know, she was very like, do this, 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 and this. And it was kind of a profound moment because it, you know, being first-time authors and Jesse, first-time illustrator uh, in a project of this scope, it, it just kind of, it was a moment where we felt compelled to, or empowered to, like, kind of take a little bit more will seize some control of the process back. And like, oh, yeah, yeah, we're actually the ones writing the book. And, and um, yeah, we, we have some control over here of what gets in and what gets out and what, what the tone is. And in the absence of that advocacy, yeah, they'll sort of try to push you where they want it to go. But um, ultimately, like, we were able to kind of get off our heels a little bit in that moment, too. And I'll just got to say, like, I, I don't know exactly what the standard format is, but I'd love for you all to just ask questions whenever you want. Um, yeah, I thanks, will, Lauren. i pass the microphone off. Um, I think that because of the recording, we do need to have you talk in the microphone. Yeah. You can yell. Usually they prefer for recordings to oh, be on the microphone. Thanks, I'm just going to throw that out there for MCAT. <laughs> Well, speaking to that process of leaving things in, keeping things out, or leaving things out, I'm wondering if there's anything that wasn't included in the book that you tried to push for that just couldn't make it in. I'm, I mean, I know your research process was lengthy, so I'm sure there is information that's not in the uh, not in the book or illustrations that maybe couldn't find a a place. But yeah, what what was left out that's not in the book that we can read out there? Yeah, so I went really deep on all uh, on the insurance industry and um, some of the perverse incentives built into the insurance industry and some of the legal theory that drives insurance. And as a business 
professor. I just thought it was fascinating and started writing a journal article within this book. And I felt very proud of it. And, and I thought it did a great job of like just illustrating how amazingly complicated and Byzantine and um, fraught the topic of insurance, particularly in fire prone lands is, and uh, how we might get through it with all sorts of pooling of risk and uncorrelated risks and all these other fancy things that uh, Nick quickly told me that did not belong in the book. So that was one thing. And then we also uh, had to make choices about how deep to go on certain stories. And, and there is one story about the Caldor fire in California, which I think was three years ago now. Um, anybody familiar with that fire? Well, it started in the um, foothills of the Sierra in central California. It tore through a community called Grizzly Flats. And that was profiled in a 60 Minutes uh, episode last fall. Uh, it made it over Echo Summit and approached South Lake Tahoe and then um, stopped. And at the time, the Forest Service hailed that as a, as a big victory, that the fire wasn't able to reach down into South Lake Tahoe and get to those homes. And they cited a lot of the amazing work of the firefighters, but also some of the preventative work they had done as well. So we had this community in Central California um, that was burned over and not part of the story, but also the Forest Service saying we did all these great things here. It just became clear that, wow, there's just so much to this story, and it's, it's fresh and controversial. But as we were trying to build that in, it felt like that doesn't really belong in a book. That belongs in a piece of journalism you know, in a long form in a magazine or something. So things like that. Uh, I think it was mostly about like what level of detail is appropriate. Um, Fireline, we chose to bring a lot of the story of Fireline um, to life through characters, right? And I think that um, type of writing and type of storytelling is particularly compelling in podcasting when you can bring voices and scenes into um, the program in a different way. In a book like this, um, characters weren't as important. We have some in the book, but we had to make different choices about how we portray those characters. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, I would have had a hundred illustrations if we could, but we didn't have all that time and that number of pages to work with too. Were there illustrations that you like really wanted in that couldn't get in, or? Oh gosh, um, you know, I think um, I'd like to think that we did a really great job with the process. As far as I didn't actually, we didn't finalize our our illustration list until after the manuscript had been submitted, um, which was pretty intentional. I mean, I think uh, just noting also a very real part of this project is that all three of us work full time jobs that are not writing books <laughs> or illustrating. And so just like we tried to make the process as streamlined as possible so that, um, and I really appreciated that from Justin and Nick's, you know, standpoint too. Like they made sure that I didn't have to do a bunch of work that wasn't going to be included in the book. Um, so I don't think there are any illustrations that were created that weren't included. Um, but I think, you know, to your point, there's so many there are so many stories about wildfire, and there's so many nuances to wildfire um, that you know it would take multiple books to like really paint that full picture. And I think that um, you know my hope is that this this book will inspire folks to then go on and like do more research. There's you know there's so much to be there's so so many rich conversations to be had around fire and equity, um, which I think that that story, the story of that fire really starts to get at is like, which communities are affected, which populations are affected, and how, um, how are populations affected differently? And like, you know, what are all the factors that play into that? Um, when thinking about smoke, like in, in your work, you know, how, how do we approach um, sort of the effects of wildfire like smoke? Or you know insurance and and think it, think about that um, with the lens of equity and like you know who has who has access to fire insurance who has access to like you know 
something as simple as like a fan or an air filter. Um, and gosh, I mean, so many stories too that I know the, the podcast dived into a little bit more just within the world of firefighting and, and how that world is changing. And the book does a really great job I think of getting into that a little bit, and um, and there's you know there's so much more to learn there too about the world of firefighting and how that's changed for folks. Um, so, yeah, I think you know there could be <laughs> there could be a dozen more books that that focus on those, and hopefully Justin will write that. I want to read the piece on insurance. <laughs> Maybe we'll see it in a journal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are there further right now? Yeah, I got you. This relates to the creativity part. Um, I live in Oregon, and um, one of my friends was, um, her house was completely destroyed, and um, she's a poet. And so she turned this into a book about that trauma that was very much helped her with her healing. And, you know, she really has, um, part of it is talking about the beauty of fire talking about how it changes objects, changes the environment with a, that kind of strange beauty. And I wonder how you address the trauma of fire. Yeah, we met this pretty incredible woman named Nelda St. Clair. Nelda worked for the um, Bureau of Land Management for many years. Before that, she was a wildland firefighter herself, and she experienced what's called a burnover when you're overtaken by a wildfire as you're fighting the fire, and you have to deploy a shelter, which is essentially like a tinfoil bag to protect you from the wildfire. And you're in there like a bivy sack, and it, it can be very traumatic. And afterward, she underwent um, a formal process um, called SISM, which is Critical Incident Stress Management. And it's a process of trying to debrief the trauma that you experienced in the workplace. And it was administered by the um, federal government. And she found that process to be offensive because it was um, not so much by intent, but more by construction, that it was um, sort of not, in her words, uh, the people uh, trying to help her were not of fire. They didn't really understand the culture and what she and her colleagues had experienced. And so she set about trying to improve those systems. And she also took it upon herself to start tracking statistics that weren't being tracked, um, incidents of suicide in the firefighting corps. And, um, she, her research revealed some pretty alarming trends. And those trends have been improving in the last few years. Um, less suicide in the firefighting corps, less uh, reports of anxiety and depression. And so I think in Elda's uh, and others' observations, the you know, firefighting for many years was kind of a good old boys club, right? And you didn't talk about stressors. You didn't talk about how hard the job is. You didn't talk about loss. And like, I have a good friend um, who were, he's a former professor at the university, but also he was a smoke jumper before that. He was on a fire in Alaska, learned of the death of one of his closest friends on a fire in Colorado, and the next day had to go jump. And that just was the, the way the job was done. And that's, you know, starting to change, not so much in how the resources are deployed, but in how um, the difficulty of the job is talked about and the toll is taking. And so there's better systems in place, um, but also it sounds, it sounds like the culture's opening up to being more supportive and more open to talking about the stress of the job. Um, another piece of the trauma that we talk about is um, you know, around loss and loss of landscape. That's a real thing called solastasia. It is this, you know, it, it, it derives from the word solace. So you look at a landscape and, you know, there's a comfort in that. And when that landscape changes, there can be a sense of loss associated with that. And um, even if that change in the landscape 
as part of a natural process, there can still be a loss. And so there's this trauma associated with that too, and the, the loss of property and whatnot. And so there is, it's a pretty, there's a lot of layers to it. And I'm sure in the case of your friend, like bringing that, bringing that to life through a creative process is hugely important. In our case, trying to, it's a different form of creativity, but trying to bring a set of um, you know, tangible things that you can do to move through a really daunting problem. That was kind of our approach to addressing trauma and loss and challenge and uh, pernicious problem as best we could. Um, that's such a good question. And I, I just wanted to highlight um, a story in the book um, and let you in on a secret. My favorite illustration in the book is the uh, illustration of Camus. I think I had the most fun uh, <laughs> creating that illustration. Um, and I'll let um, Justin dive into the story itself more because he and Nick um, were uh, spent some time with um, the late Tony Incasola Sr. and Tony Incasola Jr. Um, who are both members of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes and um, got to learn from them the story of um, trauma and healing, um, which is, and I'll, I can just kind of summarize it from the, from the trauma standpoint, the idea that a lot of indigenous communities have had fire taken from them in a sense, that like fire, um, as I mentioned in my introduction, is, is a tool and a relative that's been, you know, wor used and worked with by indigenous communities for, you know, since time in immemorial, um, and is a is a big part of a lot of indigenous cultures. Um, and on the Flathead Reservation, um, that story, this this story, I think, really sort of embodies that relationship, and that fire is something that was. Um, taken from those communities through the process of colonization. And when fire was was brought back into those communities by members of the community, the result was that this facamus, this incredibly important food crop, was also like showed back up on the landscape and came back. And that, I think, to me, that's one of the more powerful stories of trauma and healing, kind of looking at looking at it like flipping it on its head a little bit because we often think about trauma coming from the presence of fire and in this case the trauma came from the absence of fire and I think that's it's really important to sort of hold those two things together and to recognize that they're not mutually exclusive um, that they can both be true and that you know cultural burning is not a thing of the past that indigenous communities you know used to do but don't anymore but that it's still like this really important part of uh, of the culture and lifestyle for a lot of communities, um, and that it can, you know, reintroducing fire can also be healing, um, and and in some cases it can also be traumatic. So I think recognizing that duality is um, can be a really is a really powerful part of this book. I think, and I'll, maybe I'll let you talk a little bit more about that story itself if you want. Yeah, we spent, as Jesse mentioned, a pretty amazing uh, afternoon up in the Jocko Prairie. Uh, along the Jocker River on the Flathead Reservation with um, with Junior and Senior, and uh, Tony Senior told us stories from his childhood of when you know his grandmother would take him camping, and they would basically the one of the first things as they were clearing their campsite, what they would they would burn the land, and they would talk about their relationship with fire. And he also talked about like how, how just fire was not viewed as this sort of thing that needed to be put out at all costs. It was viewed as a gift. And he said that many times, he used the word gift. And um, yet, part of the culture of fire suppression that we talked about was also the suppression of culture, right? The culture, you know, cultural burning, cultural practices, the in, in indigenous introduction of fire to the landscape, those important pieces of culture were snuffed out as well, sometimes violently. Often there were, you know, people were killed for introducing fire to the landscape. And 
this particular piece of land had become overgrown and choked up and unhealthy and the cattle had been allowed to graze there and it became a place that not many people wanted to go even though it was a really important piece of, of land. And it took them many years to sort of figure out how to introduce fire, but when they did, it was done so in a controlled fashion. And nobody had ever, you know, there had been stories of camas on this piece of land, but nobody had ever seen it. Nobody living had ever seen it. And um, people thought it, yeah, maybe it'll come back in a few years. It came back the next year. And the prairie was lush and purple. And not only is this the brilliance of the camas flower and so forth, but it also brings back, um, you know, there's so many you know, it's a food crop, but it's also a part of culture and ceremony, and so it brings back a lot of culture that had been snuffed out as part of putting out fires as well. So there's a lot of different layers to it that are illustrative of, you know, not only is fire not bad or good, but that putting it all out has more consequences than just creating an ecosystem out of balance. It creates a society out of balance in many ways as well. Thank you. There. You? Yeah. yeah. Question. Um, I don't know. We got till four thirty, I think. Hey, yeah, you got twenty minutes. Okay, I'll just try it out to take up the whole twenty minutes. <laughs> no. Um, thank you. It's been really, yeah, really interesting. Um, and I remember when Jesse was talking about uh, doing the illustrations and showing us the drafts? It was like, so cool. Um, I was going to ask about the sort of overlay of, I wanted to hear more about the insurance industry perhaps, and the overlay of capitalist interests in wildfire, and sort of what we might be looking at in terms of how you know climate change is going to impact where we live and how we live, and how those capitalist interests are going to also be like involved in those decisions going forward. Yeah, 20 minutes. Sure. Um, well, I mean, what we see now, in my view, is a system that's kind of past a breaking point. So a lot of insurers are publicly traded companies, and they've got a growth and profit and motive and mandate from their shareholders. And so like State Farm Insurance, for example, has decided that California is not a profitable market for them to operate in. The, the losses that they have to pay out are simply not worth the premiums that they're able to harvest. So they pulled out of that market completely. Now, is that necessarily what should happen? Probably not. There probably needs to be, in the absence of, well, OK. So, we could decide as a society that we don't want to have private insurers, that we could nationalize disaster insurance. That's possible. Problem with any form of insurance in natural disaster right now is that a thing that sinks insurance conceptually is correlated risk. When one risk correlates with another risk, right? Um, and before sort of climate change became quite such a driving force of natural disaster, you know, having wildfires in one, a bad wildfire season in one state wasn't necessarily related super closely to another state. Or having a bad hurricane season didn't necessarily mean that there would be a bad fire season. Those sort of things weren't as related as they are now. So yeah, you could pool, and this is one interesting proposal, is to pool all natural disasters into one type of insurance and then mandate that that insurance is purchased by taxpayers or who, whatever population you want to specify. That's potentially a way through this because it creates a bigger pool of risk to spread those premiums over. Um, we actually think there's a lot of promise to a, a, a nationalized policy or a nationalized program like that, but it takes a lot of political will to get there. I do think, however, that insurance plays a vital role in this in that the insurance companies actually are the ones that are pricing the risk in the system. Um, a local 
administrator who, who gets to approve a building permit or not, that person doesn't have to price the risk. That person actually faces a moral hazard in their job because they can reap the benefits of approving a building permit in a place that is likely to burn or has some risk because they and their immediate local government receive a lot of the tax revenue that comes from that. Those, those municipal governments are largely funded by property tax, right? So as the administrator, I get a lot of benefit from that uh, tax revenue, but I don't necessarily bear the full cost of the risk because the suppression cost, if a fire comes through, often comes from the federal government. So there's a disconnect between you know, who makes the choice about the risk versus who bears the cost. In the case of insurance, you say what you want about the profit motives and how much these companies make, but they actually put a price on the risk. And that price on the risk can be a mechanism for helping us make better decisions on how we build and where we build. Right? So we can see that both in turn. I think there's, there's a mechanism with insurance, but also with the mortgage industry. Like most of us you know, borrow money to buy a home. Very few of us can afford to pay cash for a home. Um, so oftentimes you got to realize, like when you buy a home, it's not so much you buying it as it is the bank buying it, right? They're buying a lot more of it up front. And that's another mechanism. Because I do think we're building more homes, more and more homes in places that will burn. And there's a disconnect between who's approving that building and who bears the cost of that building. So I don't know if I'm doing any good to address your question. Um, but I do think that. Uh, and this is a debate that Nick and I have. I'm not an apologist for the insurance companies by any stretch, but I do think what they do in pricing the risk is a really important function um, that uh, kind of almost transcends the political process in a way. Is a, pol a politician can say that climate change exists or doesn't exist or in a battery die. So a politician, get cut off. I mean, it's easy for a politician to say if climate change is real or not, right? But it's much harder for, I mean, to a, to a person who's a, an insurance underwriter, it doesn't matter if it's real or not. What matters are the statistics of what they're paying out. Right? So there's um, there's a there's a purity to that reality. Can't, you know, if we can use that pricing mechanism in a productive way, it can maybe help us be more thoughtful about how we build. But also, um, having infiltrated the American Planning Association as a welfare mitigation professional, um, there's a lot to be said for kind of the moral hazard, but also just an entire group, a couple of industries not having any understanding of why the fire. And that there's sort of an incentive to put bigger houses on smaller lots and push the suburbs out. So instead of taking something that could be beneficial and regenerative, say, put one house per acre and let each individual manage that lot and give us an opportunity to restore the landscape at a more private level where you know we're not having to bid a ton of contracts out and like, oh, I hope for a blogging company or even just a thinning company, like I hope this one gets taken this year so that such unit doesn't break down. Um, we're also missing just a huge piece of the puzzle in addressing, you know, the issue with developers and building materials, um, city planners, and it's just local governments. I think this is our opportunity to do better going forward. We have the information we need and now let's act on. I think that one of the things that is a point of tension in there is right now our housing crisis we have in Montana where we need to build, 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 build to deal with that. We don't have enough homes. People who are here who want to be here. And you have a statistic where 93% of the new homes in Montana are in the Wui. And I've seen a map of the Missoula Wui. The only part that's not the Wui is the mall. So in Montana, where can we build? Like what can how do we deal with our need for more housing and the need to reduce risk by reducing the amount of homes we're putting into the woody? And um, 
It's everywhere. The wildland urban interface, which there was a, an yeah, illustration. There was an illustration. Uh, yeah. But I think also as planners and mitigators, we're also losing our chance to say this country is the movie. Like it's not just the city. Like you're either a part of nature or you're a part from it. So it's not that the mall is the only part that isn't in the movie. All of Missoula is the movie. All of Missoula used to burn before we came to Dover. We are not removing ourselves from nature. We need to recognize that we still are nature. And we need to allow fire to come through this whole space still, but we need to make sure that we can take the steps to stay safe so that if we do have to evacuate as a town, we can do so and come back and find most of our so there are things we can do and we need to recognize we are the movie. And short of like living on Mars, we will never not be the movie. And yeah, that was a question, question I also I'm oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, I mean like you're saying that we need to learn to live with fire, we need to learn like now you're saying, you know, we live in this place that used to just completely burn. So yeah, I guess after having <laughs> written this book, like what conclusions can you come to about how do we do that? Like I can't imagine like fire coming through Missoula and us just being like, oh, it's fire time, and like, we've got to, <laughs> you know, we've all got to leave rather than being, like, needing to suppress it, but you're also saying that suppressing it is not necessarily good, so I don't know, where do you stand up that tension? Yeah, I, th I think the thing that has helped me kind of feel like a way through is possible is um, the work of uh, Dr. Jack Cohen. Some of you might know Jack, a retired uh, Forest Service um, scientist. He was one of the first voices to say that it's actually not a fire coming through a town that is the biggest risk to structures. It's a flooding ember finding weakness on your home. And he'd study fire site after fire site. And take a look at some of the pictures from Paradise, California. You'll see homes that were just vaporized down to the foundation, but trees sort of around them, looking almost still green and, and healthy. And so um, Jack and others realized that, wait a second, we don't have a fire problem, we have a home emission problem. And so understanding how homes ignite can be a, an important insight into rethinking like how we not only organize communities, but how we allocate resources to address wildfire instead of building an apparatus to, um, there's never going to be enough firefighters or fire engines or whatever to protect every home. But if we can make our homes um, more resilient to wildfire, we can use better building materials and we can do basic maintenance to keep vegetation away from our homes, clean our gutters. Um, there's been a picture going around the internet a lot lately about the miracle home in Lahaina. And it's a pretty stark image of just one home that survived uh, where all the homes around it were vaporized and you know, probably a lot of luck at the end of the day. But that home did have a fairly new wooden roof installed in 2021. It had vegetation cleared around it. It wouldn't have, sorry, metal roof. Wooden roof is now. <laughs> Most of the homes around it had wooden roof. Yes. <laughs> now, a metal roof installed in 2021, gravel, you know, and uh, so forth, uh, you know, sort of smart landscaping around the home. And the homeowner has said, like, we didn't really do this stuff with wildfire in mind. The result is, or a possible result is that home survived and others did not. So, you know, yes, we need to be thoughtful about how we construct our communities, where we build, how we build. We have to build with the right stuff right way and each take ownership of our own space and try to make it as um, safe as possible because yeah you're right it, I mean fires in China smoke on the east coast uh, just the, the, the we pulled the future forward in many ways with, with this climate change and we see that fire is going to be happening in a lot more places than we thought it was did it's going to be happening a lot more often I'd like to ask this, all three of you, having been in the discussion now for a couple of years in the book or longer in your work, what's the most tragic element of where we're at? Uh, I think for me, what 
I love taking it because my background is smoke and air quality, and it is the inequities of protection. Um, uh, we know we're going to have smoke every year, and some people will be able to just go inside, turn on there, have an air cleaner, and wait it up, and it'll be fine. Although there's still the mental health aspects of being stuck inside in the gray skies and all that goes along with it. And then every time I go to give a talk about smoke and whatnot, someone asks, what are, you, what are you doing for unhoused? What are you doing for your outdoor workers, for people who have no protections? What are you doing for people who have um, you know, housing that they aren't able to keep smoke out or they can't afford a way to clean the smoke? And there are no systems in place to help those people on a national level. There are some states that have taken some steps, um, but everything we've done locally in Missoula to address smoke for our vulnerable community members is by getting competitive grants and by soliciting donations. And when I get a grant or Climate Smart Missoula gets a grant, that means another community did not get that grant. Um, and so there's just this huge inequity for smoke protection, which is going to keep happening and needs to keep happening as we have more fire in the landscape to restore the landscape. There's going to be more smoke. We don't have communities who are actually in a place to be prepared for that health burden, and um, thousands of people die every year from smoke exposure. So um, for me, that is that lack of equity. I have three air cleaners in my home. I have air monitors in my home. I'm set, but that's not helpful for everybody. So talk to your neighbors. Make sure they know what to do. I, I'm watching our time click down, and I've never been to uh, Montana Festival of the Book event before, and I was really hoping that I could hear the author read one of his favorite passages before we, we run up against time. We yeah. didn't have five minutes, so I just had to pause instead, it. Of, instead of talking about what I think is the most tragic. No, I'm sorry. Did, uh, yeah, you should. Sorry. My bad. I can be quick with that answer and still get it while I'm reading. Okay, okay. Sorry. Uh, sorry Christopher, Christopher, I guess the thing I think is most tragic is when we, shortly after 1910, became hell bent on fire suppression. It didn't have to be that way. In fact, there was a cadre of people in fire, fire service and other agencies saying, no, we need a more thoughtful approach, prescribed burning, uh, controlled burning. Um, and they lost in the power struggle. And it didn't necessarily play fair in the power struggle. There was rigged studies, propaganda campaigns, and so forth. So that was kind of a, a dark time our history that uh, we're sort of living with some of the consequences of it now. Um, I can add really quickly, I I mean I would very much echo everything that um, that Sarah said uh, in terms of just like the inequities and the effects of wildfire. Um, I also think that one of the biggest tragedies in fire, and it's it's a little ironic that it's like just you know now in the last year we've really been looking to cultural burning and indigenous burning practices to learn from. Um, but as Justin said, like those were snuffed out for so many years, for so many cultures. And it's now tragic, really tragic in retrospect to think like not only was so much harm done to those communities, which is, you know, that could be a whole talk in and of itself. Um, but now like, now the fire, you know, fire management is coming back to those communities and saying like, oh, actually we need to learn from these communities. There was just a policy passed in California a few weeks ago, AB 642, I think it's called, um, that finally recognizes indigenous cultural burners as having the same expertise as state and federal certified burn bosses. And that just happened, but indigenous communities have been, have been using fire as a tool in the landscape for so long there's a lot of tragedy in the fact that within suppression that that wasn't recognized for so long. Um, and so much of that is exactly what you said and what I've heard so many of my elders say, which is like, we are a part of, not apart from this landscape, and this landscape is shaped by fire, and therefore fire is a part of all of us, no matter how separate it might feel. And so I think it's tragic that that we haven't embraced that. Okay, so this is a brief passage uh, from uh, the introduction to the book. 
One day this summer, a lightning bolt will strike an old ponderosa pine, or a gust of wind will send a power line to the ground, or a car will light up some vegetation on an overgrown double track road. A train will send off a spark. The burning entrails of a firework will rain down on a juniper. Someone will take a lighter to a blade of grass. There's no way to eliminate fire, but we can mitigate its severity and how it affects us. Doing that requires thinking long term. It requires changing ourselves and our homes and engaging with the world around us and our neighbors in ways we might not have considered before. Fire season is at least 80 days longer now than it was 30 years ago. By the end of the century, experts anticipate extreme fire events to rise by 50% across the world. That means flames will burn bigger in area. That, that means flames will burn bigger during more parts of the year, from temperate grassland to tropical, tropical savanna to tundra in Australia, Greece, the Amazon, Indonesia, Arctic, and beyond. We mobilized an army to fight a never-ending war on fire. Yet we build deeper into areas ready to go up in flames. And we keep ramping up our burning of fossil fuels, contributing to the warming of our planet and making conditions ripe for bigger, more extreme blazes. We're at a precarious moment for wildfire in the US. We can keep thinking about these conflagrations the same way, or we can change course. The question driving this book is, how, we, how can we recognize both truths of wildfire? It threatens and destroys so much of what we love, our homes, our livelihoods, our mental state, our very ability to breathe. But it's also a process that's completely natural. It rejuvenates forests and ecosystems. Fire has burned across the earth longer than our species has walked the planet. How do we live in a world with fire? How do we manage it? And how do we manage ourselves? Thank you. And I want to thank all of you coming here, and Justin, and Jesse.